Harry Chan, was a student in my class when I was a substitute teacher who took over for the design technology and yearbook teacher at the American Overseas School of Rome. Harry was the editor-in-chief of the yearbook, which I had no clue what I was doing. And the thing about Harry is he's one of those people that is really smart, hardworking, organized, and also kind and empathetic, super helpful. And he basically helped me through that whole process of taking over for the yearbook, making sure that all the different aspects of it were top notch and that we had a product to be proud of, despite the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic and lockdown and had no events for the whole second semester of school to put into the yearbook. It was just fantastic working with him. And I respect and admire and appreciate you, Harry. And this as a 10th grader. Now, Harry is an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and he's planning to study physics. Harry has Chinese blood flowing in his veins, but he grew up along the banks of the Tiber River in Italy. During his downtime at Berkeley, he volunteers in an aid organization, connects with other ethnic Chinese students in a university-based club, and regularly holds Harry's review sessions, helping his friends with their academic work. The guiding question for this episode was, what does it mean to be a third culture kid, TCK, also known as cross-cultural kid? Harry described growing up as a Chinese national in Italy. He attended a private Italian school for most of his elementary education and then came over to the American Overseas School of Rome as a middle schooler. So he was able to kind of reflect on the differences between the two systems and to talk about the differences among the various worlds in which he lives. We also discussed the attributes that he gained from living in these cultures and how those characteristics support him now as a college student and will likely support him on into adulthood. He also gave a few tips for teachers of cross-cultural students and advised fellow student travelers as they make the jump into university life. This episode was recorded on January 10th, 2023. Take it away, Harry. Hello and welcome, Harry. We're so excited you're on the Educators Going Global podcast with us. Hello. Thanks for having me. Let's start with our big question of where in the world are you? I'm currently in Rome. I'm a student at UC Berkeley in California. So, Harry, we would love to hear, if you have one, a going global story. My story is about being a new person who is new to the States and transition that experience from going from Rome to Berkeley, California. This is my first time leaving Rome, and this is my first time leaving my family. So I'm excited and at the same time nervous about what will come to me in the near future. And everything went smoothly at the airport. Everything went well with the luggage and stuff. However, I was astonished by and shocked by the new culture that was experienced in the U.S. One thing that I want to talk about today is about their food. I never thought that a portion of food can be so large (laughs) that none of us in my family could finish it. So what we turn out to have is a to-go box every day that we're going to pick up all the food that's left on the table and back to our hotels. Yeah. So that was something new to me. And I never thought having so much portion can be a problem for our stomach and how much food can bring so much weight. So yeah, as as I said, I gained some weight in during those days. And that basically was a new experience for me. And that's my going global story. Yeah, that makes sense. The portions in the US are crazy. And so what I tend to do with my family is either if I go to a restaurant, say, either I'm going to agree to share my meal with someone from the beginning, 
or I bring extra, like you say, boxes with me, plastic containers to know ahead of time that I'm going to take at least half of it back home and have two or three more meals out of it. Because yeah, otherwise you just, you don't feel that good. And either you're wasting it, which I can't stand, or you're eating too much, which is not healthy for you. So yeah, that's a really, you know, that's something that I wouldn't necessarily have thought about, but that makes a lot of sense. What a story. So Harry, that really connects to our guiding question, which is, what does it mean to be a third culture kid, aka a cross-cultural kid? So Harry, your story is a little different from the typical story because you're a Chinese national who grew up in Rome. Can you please tell us a little bit about your background story? Yeah, so my parents are both Chinese from Zhejiang, a province, Wenzhou, the city, where they migrated to Rome, Italy in the 2000s, seeking for a better job opportunity. And I was born there and I lived my entire life here. So people always make fun of me saying that I'm rather an Italian rather than Chinese <laughs> since I live my entire life here in Italy. And a background story about my education is that I received my elementary education in an Italian school and then moving forward with middle school and high school in an American international school. So I do consider myself pretty much a blended individual in the sense that I do have my Italian background, I have my Chinese blood, and I receive my international education. So that's an overall picture of me. And now I'm 18 years old and at a university, UC Berkeley. So that's another American school where I'm receiving and processing all the new culture that I've never exposed to in the past. <laughs> so that's it, I guess. Well, just to dig in a little bit more, would you say, so you started off in an Italian school, would you say that it has made a difference that the fact that you then went on to an American school so that you feel at least a little bit acclimatized to what it would be like to be in an American university? Do you think that was a good move or Rather, if you had stayed in Italian schools right through high school, what do you think the differences might be there? In terms of the process of identifying myself, I don't find that um, that made a difference. In the sense, in my opinion, moving to an American school, it mainly changed my education process rather than my identification process. I still believe if I were to attend all my education career in an Italian school, I would still consider myself as Chinese-Italian where now I'm still considering as Chinese-Italian, even though I received an American education. But I do believe that American education has broadened my perspective in the sense that the school, the high school, provided more resources and a greater range of possible opportunities that the Italian schools might not be able to provide. So I think that made the big difference between an Italian school and an American school. Okay. One of the things I've been reading about lately is this new term, cross-cultural kid. In the past, we used third culture kid, TCK. And this makes a lot of sense because we have people like you who are moving between cultures. It's just not a third culture, but it's multiple cultures. So it's great that you're here to help explain this to us. So looking at yourself, Harry, what do you see as some of your attributes connected to being a CCK? So let's say if I were to compare to a typical Chinese student who received their education in China and lived in her life in China, I will consider that I am at least a little bit more open to new views and perspectives and being less traditional, like quote unquote traditional of a typical Chinese person. In the sense that I believe being a third culture kid, I'm able to receive more perspectives by nature. In a sense, I could receive my Chinese culture in family, my Italian culture on the roads or when I talk to people, and a little bit of my international culture or education here at school. So I do think being a third culture kid, I have the ability to access multiple cultures at the same time. So that provided some advantage compared to a typical Chinese student who lived their entire life in the same place, who have the same people or similar people around them rather than an international subset of people that are more mobile and tending to move around a little bit more. 
And I do believe an attribute that mainly share among us is the bridge that we can create between cultures. Often cases, we see ourselves the bridge, in my case, between Italian and Chinese culture, where people from China, if they question about cultures around Italy or Italian people are wondering about the Chinese culture, I can often speak for both sides and make this connection for people. So I think having this ability to create this bridge is really important and people really need that to understand different cultures better. That's fantastic. I love that you see yourself as that bridge. I really appreciate that. So you see yourself as a bridge and boy, howdy, we need more people to take on this attribute to help bring people together. And this, in my mind, really connects to Stephen Covey's personal trait of seeking to understand which also connects to learning about multiple perspectives, which is such a big part of being a cross-cultural kid. So, Harry, let me continue a little bit along this theme. What were some differences that you noticed, if any, between CCKs at the Italian private school versus at the American school? So, since I only received my Italian education only between the five youngest years in elementary. Mm. So I quiz a little bit about it. So based on my memory and the friends that I'm still having from the, my Italian schools, something that I've realized is that CCKs in the Italian schools tend to have a deeper connection with the Italian culture. I think that's because the fact that since Italian schools focus and emphasize on Italian culture only, rather than an American international school where they try to bring awareness around the globe and not emphasizing as much compared to an Italian school. So I think that's the reason why CCKs at Italian school, they tend to have a deeper and a tighter connection with the Italian culture. So that's one difference that I see. Then with that same theme, they tend to identify themselves more Italian than CCKs at the American school. I think that's because of their education and their exposure to the Italian culture. And the time that blends them together, it's more evident compared to an international school. And definitely I see CCKs in the international schools, they tend to have better English skills <laughs> compared to an Italian school people. since. In American international school, the main language of instruction is English. So that's why they have a better English, which makes logical sense. And likewise, they tend to have a weaker Italian speaking skill since Italian language is not as emphasized as in Italian school. So that's a pro and con depending on the point of view. And definitely, I think the CCKs at an international school tend to find a harder time to identify themselves compared to an Italian school, since the Italian culture is mainly emphasized, a child could easily identify themselves as Italian compared to American school that the culture is more spread and not as focused on one specifically. So the CCKs at the international schools have a harder time to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, speak perfectly flawless Italian English and Chinese. So are, are there any other languages you speak, by the way? I'm learning Spanish as well. Oh, to... my goodness. Way to go. That's good. Good for you. Harry, I'm intrigued about your Chinese connection and the Italian experiences and the differences between the two. It makes me curious to ask, what were some of your experiences growing up that you realize might be different from your extended family members' experiences back in China? So if I were to compare myself with my family members back in China, I see a lot of differences between myself and them. So one of the main difference I see is our difference in education. So basically, since I received a international and a multi-culture education, my learning objective varies a lot compared to them. In China, the main objective or outcome that an education institution hopes their student to have is a good testing skill because they have to face 
the famous Gao Kao, where that identify themselves as which tier they are in and which college they could attend. So because of the nature of the education back in China, the students tend to be more task oriented and exam focused rather than here we tend to be more creative and more and thinking out of the box to find solutions. So that's one big difference that I see from my family members back in China. But then I also realized that our connection with the world, with the society is different. So I see that in China, people's relationship tend to be a close loop where the people they meet are in the same city and not move as much as people outside of the society. Where here, I can meet people around the globe, across different continents, and it's pretty hard to make a close loop as the connections are so spread. So I could say it's almost impossible to close this loop, whereas for them, it's pretty simple to close the loop. So I think that's another connection that I saw. The last one I would say is the ability to perceive the world. For them, at least from my opinion, their worldview tends to be a little bit limited because they tend to only focus on what's happening around themselves, around their societies, and not as focused or curious about the world outside of their societies. Compared to us, CCKs, I think we're curious about what's happening around the globe and we want to know how is that affecting us. I think this worldview has carried us in different ways, in the sense that we respond to the same event different ways. And then we tend to have different thinking processes compared to them. They tend to follow the crowd, whereas we are more independent thinkers. So that's a main difference that I see between me, or at least the CCKs, and the people in China, back in China. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think the closed loop idea makes a lot of sense. And it probably is one of the things that allows people to feel grounded, people who grew up somewhere, know where they're from, know who their family is, and so on, and have that more closed loop kind of perspective. So part of what makes you different as a CCK is the expanded worldview and the idea that you have connections with people from all over the place. Are there any other specific characteristics that you see in yourself as an adult that you could attribute to being a CCK? I think us CCKs tend to be more brave in the sense since we're so used to changes and we can get used to things pretty quickly, in my opinion. So I think we are okay or we are used to be presented to a new kind of environment and we can get used to it pretty quickly. So I think that's one of the main attributes that shaped how I react and how I face different environments. But I also think we are more, we tend to be more flexible and we tend to be more used to changes. So being a CCK means that we often need to change our environment. We have to travel around or we need to get used to new kind of new set of people. And I think the flexibility that that brings in or the skill of being flexible is really the key to make us feel confident and make us feel balanced because every place around the globe is different and we cannot use the same standards or the same habits or traditions to fix a standard for every place. So I think being flexible for toward ourselves really helps us to quickly integrate into different societies. And that, I think it's our uniqueness being a CCK, where this ability might be challenged and not as praised in different parts of the globe or different people, different people's opinion. So I think that's mainly how it has affected me as growing up as an adult now. You know what I think is so cool about that is it reminds me of The design cycle, the engineering cycle, where you have the problem and you iterate upon it until you've figured something out. And I love that answer. That's right. Harry, we really appreciate your self-reflection as we're putting you on the spot here and you are sharing such gems with our audience. 
So our audience is mainly international educators, but also some teachers who want to become international. So what advice would you give K-12 international teachers about supporting cross-cultural kids in their classrooms? What are the ways they can acknowledge them, take steps to help them grow, and I think most importantly, take advantage of the characteristics you've been talking about? So I think from a teacher's perspective, I do think understanding and encouragement, it's a vital attribute that they should present to the student. They should understand that CCKs are a little bit different than usual kids. We don't have a connection that's as strong as other kids in the norm between themselves and the culture. So knowing that, having that in mind, really helps the way they see their student in the classroom and definitely encourage them to explore the on the globe and explore themselves and explore their identities. I think this encouragement really helps the student to identify themselves. And I do think those understanding and encouragement it's vital uh, it's vital for a teacher to support CCKs and as well if needed I think communication with parents is also necessary because I think oftentimes parents might not know what's happening in the school and they might not even know how the culture in the school is different from theirs at home. So I think having a teacher that makes the connection between schools and family, or in other words, between the culture at home and the culture at school, this bridge really helps the teacher and the parents to identify potential problems or, or need a support for their kids or student to succeed and overcome the obstacles. So I think having the communication with the parents, if necessary, might really help the student to grow up. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. So I'm curious, you know, when my daughter went to university and she grew up as a CCK as well, she had a different upbringing from yours in terms of she had been to the States every summer and had a sense of what it was like, but she still really felt like kind of an outsider and she tended to want to gravitate more towards people who had similar experiences So I'm curious about your transfer to UC Berkeley in California and the extent to which you also have met and perhaps gravitated towards other CCKs because those are people you can really relate to. Yeah, so that was my first time flying to the US. Wow. First time stepping my foot on the ground of states. So brave. Definitely, it's a new environment and I had different adaptations and that was pretty, uh, not struggling, but definitely different. So it took me a while to adjust and to get used to it. And Mm -hmm. definitely the people that I meet since UC Berkeley, it's really international and very varied. So I can meet the local people. I can meet people from the U.S. or I can meet people from different continents. And really, I think at least so far, the connection that I've made that tends to be closer to me are people that share the similar experience as me, not necessarily Chinese people, but at least the experience of being a third culture. So I think we tend to make those tighter connections with people who have similar experience, as you said. I also think that um, having this connection is really important as we can share different stories. And sometimes we see stories of ourselves in their stories, and we have this intertwined connections between them. So that's why I think we tend to make a closer connection with different CCKs. So Harry, you're new to this experience of coming to the U.S. and you're quickly moving up that learning curve. It's really nice to hear your self-understanding that you keep thinking about where you stand, what's happening around you. And it makes me wonder if you went back to Rome and you were meeting with seniors there and, and yeah, they're super excited. They're ready to head to university, the next stage of their lives. What advice would you give to them is they make that leap into the start of adulthood. I think my advice would be just be brave and shine out your uniqueness because you are so unique and you're so different from others. And people really need your exclusive talent, especially the bridge cultures. And I think oftentimes since we're so different, we tend to hide ourselves, but there's no need to hide. Just be brave and show yourself out. 
That's a beautiful answer. I love it. I think that's great. That is a lot of wisdom from a young man. So along those lines, Harry, you shared before we started recording that you have become part of a couple of different societies at Berkeley. Maybe you can give us an idea of what those are all about. Yeah. So being a freshman, I'm super nervous about getting clubs and finding a tighter family since UC Berkeley is so huge. It's pretty hard to find a close-knit society. So I tried to apply a few clubs. And the two that I'm mainly committed this semester was a club called Spring Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization and it's a charity club where we raise funds and in turn, we hope to use the funds to support the kids in the rural parts of China to let them have a better education. So the ways we do that is we send them books and we have online Zoom meetings with them and we read with them a project called Read With Me where we have a one-on-one volunteer and a student and they just read books and hope that students will be motivated and inspired by the books. The other society, it's a more cultural related. It's a society called Berkeley Chinese Student and Scholar Association where Chinese students at Berkeley gather and they make events related to the Chinese culture. For example, in the coming weeks, we will have our Chinese New Year and we are prepping for this event to coming up. And we hope to spread our Chinese culture and let more people know the beauty of Chinese culture. That's just so cool. You know, I think to your point that reach out, shine your light, bring what you bring to the table. You've chosen a couple of clubs that just really beautifully demonstrate that you are living those values. So kudos to you. And I'm sure that that makes you feel like you're part of something and that whole idea of doing what you can to close some loops and stay in connection with your Chinese culture. Wonderful ideas. And then you also shared earlier that you have, and it's in your bio too, that you have started these Harry's Help sessions. Tell us a little bit more about that, because that's another way that you're connecting with your local community. So the Harry's Roof sessions started because of the pandemic. So that was started when the pandemic started. And I realized that at least my friends, they were suffering from the lack of socialization and the lack of academic support. So I just thought of since we got the time, since everybody was locked down at home and got plenty of free time. So why not just start up a online session, just help just answers people's questions and in hoping that that can help them. So I started that when I was in 10th grade and still continued until now, now at UC Berkeley. So before in the past, it used to be online due to COVID and my friends would just pop out in our Google meet and they just ask questions and I try to answer them at my best abilities. If it's a written assignment, I try to revise their paragraphs, point out some grammatical errors and stuff, some syntax, some suggestions. If it's a STEM-related question, try to find a tactic and clarify some misconceptions and stuff. And now at UC Berkeley, it's since I live in a dorm now, so people will just knock on my door and just ask me questions. So it will be like quick drop-in session and everybody was so happy once the questions cleared and that was my most joyful part seeing them being successful and happy about their end result you sound like a teacher (laughs) i just think it's wonderful that you've found these ways to integrate yourself into the community but also you're giving back you're just such a generous kind person so Really, from the bottom of our hearts, we want to thank you so much for taking the time, Harry. It's great to see you again and to know that you're thriving. Not that there was ever any doubt in my mind that that would happen, but uh, you're going really above and beyond what a lot of people would do in terms of reaching out and integrating yourself into the community. And as you so beautifully phrased it, shining your light. So shine on Harry. And thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Harry, it's been a pleasure to have you come on the podcast and to share so many words of wisdom and practices 
And you are definitely a busy guy. I've got a son who was a physics major, and I know you've got a lot of work in front of you in the coming years. So for today, thanks for taking the time and being with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify, and let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, if you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a Going Global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com. All our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, Going Global stories, and our ever-growing resource library. For now, this is Audrey. And David. Inviting you to travel, teach, and connect with us.